worship. Hello and welcome to worship. So glad to have you here on this rather chilly April weekend. A uh, couple of things. Number one, we welcome Bishop Regina Hassanelli from the Southeast Minnesota Synod who's uh, offering up the word today, preaching for us. And then also our mission of the month for this month is faith in action. And here is a, a special word about that. Hi there, my name is Catherine Bonin and I am the director of Faith in Action. For those of you who don't know, we are a nonprofit organization here in Red Wing. Uh, we've actually had a very long relationship with United Lutheran Congregation, and we are an organization that mainly focuses on helping individuals who are of an age 65 and older, although we don't discriminate. So if you need help and you're not 65, still feel free to ask us for help because we, we want to help you. Um, we have three programs. The one we are most known for is our transportation program. It runs within Red Wing, with an exception of we give rides to R Mayo Rochester if it's for a cancer-related appointment. The other two programs are Friendly Visiting and Book House Calls. And um, Mr. Jerry Wren will have information if you want to know more information, details about those programs. We have had a, as I mentioned, a very long relationship with United Lutheran, and um, you guys are really great at giving us financial support, which we 
so appreciate. Um, but as well as with some financial support, we are in a huge need of volunteers. And our volunteering is very flexible. You do it when it works for you. We have teachers that volunteer with us, so they only help during the summer. Sometimes we even have construction workers, so they only volunteer in the winter. Um, there are other people who give one ride a month or visit one person and it's once a month. Um, so we're really flexible. We are having a volunteer training event on April 15th. You can come at 10 a.m. or 1 p.m. And Mr. Wren will also have information about that for you. Uh, but yeah, that is our organization and we really appreciate you and our relationship with you. So thank you, United Lutheran. Let's begin our worship with a word of prayer. Holy and gracious God, we ask that your Holy Spirit stir us up, fill us up with your light, with your love, and help us to share that with the whole world. We pray this trusting in your mercy and through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Day from Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A quick pre-sermon poll. How many of you are living out the life that you had always planned? I can tell you that I am not. It's not that I've not had a plan, it's just that life has unfolded in some fairly unexpected ways. 
I went to college with a clear sense of purpose. I was going to major in biology, which I did, go to medical school, which I did not, and become a medical missionary, which hasn't happened yet. By the time I was graduating from college, I had earned that degree in biology, but I had struggled through one too many chemistry courses. I had breezed through my humanities and religious studies coursework, so medical school had long lost its appeal, but it had been a goal, part of my life plan for so long, I wasn't really sure what I would do next. I was convinced that while God certainly had plans for all of my classmates, I had somehow been overlooked. I lamented to my friends, I must be the first person in all of creation that God forgot to make a plan for. Sometimes I believed I was. What I wanted, and maybe some of you can relate, was a plan for my life laid out. Just like all the plans that I had carefully crafted for myself, I wanted some tablets that came down from on high in the mount of God's presence in the hands of a prophet telling me exactly what to do. The older I get and the more time I spend in relationship with Jesus, the more I realize that doesn't seem to be how God works. I've been living with this reading from Ephesians for quite some time. I was first drawn to it by verse 10, so that through the church, Paul writes, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might be made known. I have long loved Jesus, but the church can sometimes be a bit more of a challenge. And this verse in chapter three keeps me tethered to the truth and the promise of what God is doing with and through us as the people of God, the church. This is, as it happens, our preaching text for our upcoming Synod Assembly. And as I've been studying this chapter more and more, I've been drawn to verses eight and nine and the ways that they can shape the way we think about the verses that follow. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might be made known. Paul writes that he's been given this grace to bring to the Gentiles and to make everyone see the plan. So lo and behold, there's a plan after all. Thankfully, it's not just a plan for you or for me or any one individual. It's a plan about revealing the mystery of God, about making sure everyone, especially those on the outside, know the boundless riches of Christ. It's a plan to use the church to change the world. So here we find something to learn about what God is up to in the world and the ways that we, as some of the people in Christ church, are invited to join. But let's zoom out for just a minute and consider the words within the broader moment in which they were first written. This portion of the Bible is taken from a letter written by the Apostle Paul, or one of his students, to the church in the community of Ephesus. And Paul, as you are likely well aware, wrote a lot of letters to churches. We call them epistles. And those letters are a large portion of the New Testament. We read them now with an understanding that those letters were both written in a specific time and place in history, and that they serve as the shaping teachings of what it meant to be the church when it first began, and what it means to be the church today. These letters shape us as God's people, and they put a framework around how we live and interact as God's church. So one way to approach our reading of these scriptures is to pay attention to how we're being shaped and formed as God's people. What's the letter teaching us about God and God's work in the world? What is the letter teaching us about how we ought to behave as followers of Jesus? These are the types of wonderings that we can bring to a text like this. One more piece of helpful context. We see throughout Paul's letters references to a community of people referred to as Gentiles. And Gentiles are folks who are not of Jewish descent. And this is important because, as you know, Jesus was Jewish and his first communities of influence were Jewish. So one of the wrestlings of faith that we see throughout the New Testament is this discernment about who ought to be included among the followers of Jesus. 
Are only those of Jewish descent able to follow Jesus? Is this newly forming faith open to everyone? This was, at the formation of the Christian church, a really significant wrestling for folks because it had not only theological implications, but also implications for societal norms and expectations. And there were clear demarcations between these communities of people. So bringing them together under the umbrella of a shared religion was a really significant shift. Okay, that's probably enough context for now, but let's use that context to focus specifically on verses 7 through 12. They read, Of this gospel I have become a servant, according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have access in boldness and confidence through faith in him. Paul, who was of Jewish descent, is telling the early church that he's been given grace and good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to bring to the Gentiles. Or, in other words, to bring to a group of people who were societally very different than him. But, Paul says, the riches of Christ are boundless and the grace of Christ knows no limits. And the plan of the mystery of God is a plan of reconciliation and unification between God and humanity and between humans and humans. This is a mystery of our faith that through the church and catch the intentionality of Paul's naming the variety and diversity in that church through the church in its rich variety, the wisdom of God, a reconciled creation, is going to be made known. This is, for Paul in chapter 3 of Ephesians, the heart of what it means to be God's people, to be a people who share God's goodness and grace with all, and a people who pay special attention to those of whom we might assume are beyond the reaches of grace. This is the good news. This is the mystery and the grace that there are indeed no bounds to the riches of Jesus Christ. So what's the plan? Well, I have good news and I have bad news. The plan is clear, to share and make known the goodness and grace of God, to proclaim the gospel and to proclaim it to all, not just the people we think we want to talk to or need to talk to, or just the people we think deserve to hear it, but to everyone, every single one. Here's the not so good news. The plan lacks detail. Paul tells us that this is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages. Paul tells us this plan is accomplished through the church. But what Paul seemingly forgets to do is write down the next seven or eight steps that we're supposed to follow and check off to make sure we don't mess things up. But fortunately, we've got some clues. The good news of the gospel is shared beyond us because it's shared through us. And we, the church, make known the wisdom of God and the boundless riches of Christ because we have been reconciled to Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are now agents of reconciliation in God's world. And reconciliation always, at least eventually, calls us beyond ourselves because reconciliation by its very nature moves us beyond ourselves. Reconciliation moves us from the place we are in out into communities and into the world with a very distinct purpose, to continue and to pass on the ministry of reconciliation, this ministry that we have already received. We are, as individuals and as a church, as congregations of the church, We are called to and placed in communities in which we are able to reach beyond ourselves for the sake of ensuring the wisdom of God and the boundless riches of Christ are made known. So the step-by-step plan that's missing in Ephesians, well, it actually gets to be lived through faith by each one of us, but not just as individuals, in community, in congregation, so that we, as the church, might live into the purpose for which we have been called, making the wisdom and the goodness and the grace 
the gospel known. So maybe it's not a step-by-step -step plan at all. Maybe it's a step-by-step -step unfolding as so much of life is. I have been significantly shaped in my own faith journey by the story of Abram in Genesis 12 and the word of God spoken to him. God says to Abram, go to the land I will show you. And there is this sense in that story of a gradual unveiling of only ever being sure of the one step that's next without ever fully knowing what exactly the next steps are or where exactly the next steps will lead. I guess that's why they call it faith. The step-by-step -step plan isn't handed down from tablets on high, even though some of us might wish that it were. The step-by-step -step plan is lived. It's only realized in the stepping, in the walking, in the journeying that we make one step at a time. This can be hard for some of us, some of us like to have a plan laid out, a neatly charted course. I think part of the reason we like it is because it lets us think that we might actually be in control. But this wild and wonderful world, it isn't just ours. It belongs to God. And there is a plan and the plan is God's. And in that fulfilling, the whole world is changed. All of creation gets to live into the promise and the hope of the boundless riches of Christ, into the wisdom of God. So may we be a church in its rich variety that does indeed share and proclaim the wisdom of God, the mystery of faith. May we be a church through which such wonderful things are made known to everyone. In the name of Christ, amen. for the world, the church, our community, and all those in need. Let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for your church. We thank you especially today for your church in all its forms, especially the church on the state level, the national level, the synods that, that work throughout the whole world. Uh, we ask that you help us as your church, as your body, to do your work, to spread your light and love to all those who, who need it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for faith in action. We thank you for its ministry here in Red Wing. We ask that you continue to bless its ministry and the good work that it does. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
And then, holy and gracious God, we pray for students and teachers and faculty, for all those as the uh, end of the school year is in sight, just uh, five, six weeks away. We ask that you bless them in this time, especially those like uh, towards the end of their school career, seniors in high school, seniors in college, this incredibly exciting time. We ask that you just surround them with your love and give them patience to keep facing uh, the next few days and the next few tests. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And then finally, holy and gracious God, we pray for all those we know and love who are hurting today. Uh, we lift them up to you in our hearts right now. Pour it upon them, holy God, your Holy Spirit. Grant them your healing, your strength, and your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these things, holy God, we pray, trusting in your mercy and through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and the one who teaches us to pray. Our, our Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.